Okay, this is all about fertilizer or anything you want to call fertilizer. Fertilizer is merely an amendment you're going to add to the soil to enrich it. Enriching can be interpreted in many ways. Any material like manure or chemicals, etc., <laughs> that you put on or in the soil to improve the quality or the quantity of plant growth. Okay, now there's a little gap here. What about improving the quality of the soil? Well, fertilizer doesn't care about the soil. Soil is an inorganic mineral product made by Mother Nature. Took her low those many zillions of years to make it. And you can take all of the ingredients that make soil and mix them all together and moisten it and pat it firmly into a nice little mound and it still doesn't make soil. Soil is an extremely complex geological form. This lecture is not about soil. It is about plant nutrition. Okay? So don't get hinky with me on the, the food web. We did that already. Okay. Plant nutrients. <laughs> as much as 95% of a plant is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And where did it get it? The carbon came from CO2. The oxygen came from CO2. Hydrogen came from water, which also has an oxygen molecule on it. So most of what a plant needs is air and water. But that little missing percent, that other 5%, that's the important stuff. Those are the nutrients that we deal with and we put them on the soil or in the soil. You don't find people pouring carbon dioxide on the soil, nor do they pour oxygen on the soil. They try to pour water, but you know, that's hopeless. Okay, the mineral-based nutrients are obtained from the soil. You took your soil class, so you know what's in your soil and what kind of soil you have. You know about tilth and depth and etc. Okay, <laughs> a typical plant is composed of these, and that's only about 99.8% and this would thrill your old professor, would it not? Yes. This is what makes up our plants. Where did they get the potassium and the calcium and the phosphorus and the sulfur and the magnesium, etc., 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 from the minerals in the soil? Minerals. Okay. In your soil class, you talked about pH and how important it was, and pH is? The negative common logarithm of the hydronium ion concentration. Did everybody hear Mr. Steps? <laughs> Just a minute. We, we don't want any regular definitions. We want the definition, so we're going to do it again. It's the negative common logarithm of the hydronium ion concentration. <laughs> so there. So now in just regular English, it's the percent of hydrogen. Okay. Seven. On a scale of one to fourteen, seven right in the middle, that's neutral. That is pure deionized water. Seven. Okay? We're not there. If you read that little phony baloney paper report that comes from your water department about once a year, and you read about all the wonderful things they're doing to help you with the water, and you get to the final page, they'll give you the analysis of what is in your water, and they talk about the little bits of bacteria and stuff like that that are floating around, and they'll finally get to where they'll tell you the pH. <laughs> 
honey, they're not putting stuff in your water for your sake. They're putting stuff in your water to keep the pipes from getting clogged. They're making water very alkaline. My water is at 8.7%. It's almost greasy. Yes. Yes. If, if I have to use my water to spray, which most of you know I don't spray. I do dormant. But other than that, I'm too lazy to do that anymore. I, I have to acidify the water to make sure everything goes the way it's supposed to. Now, roses will put up with a lot, as you know, because you've got roses growing in your yard, and you know you're not the perfect gardener. So they put up with a lot. They'll put up with a pH range from about 5.5, which is really bad, really acidic, to 7.8. Now, this little 5.5, this is not an imaginary number. Most of you know that I was involved with the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, in those days, I was also a volunteer at the Berkeley Rose Garden, just something to do at lunchtime. And the city of Berkeley, in all of its liberal, <coughs> infinite wisdom, had um, a mantra that they chanted that you were not going to use anything in the rose garden. Water, yes, but no, you could not spray with anything. You could not put fertilizers, you could not do this and that and so on, unless it was natural. So they had a deal with a redwood forest byproduct person. I heard that. And so mulch was uh, shredded redwood bark. And the beds were coated with mulch two or three times a year. And if, if you've been to the Berkeley Rose Garden, it's one of the WPA gardens, amphitheater style, going down, 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 ring by ring by ring to the bottom. Well, they noticed that the roses at the bottom were dying. And they finally got a soil analysis done, which when we talk to the CRs, we say, what's the first thing you do? When you're planting a new garden, get your soil tested. What's the first thing you do if your roses start dying? Get your soil tested. What's the first thing you do if you decide you're gonna cut them all down and start over again? Get your soil tested. Find out what's going on. So they finally got their soil tested. It was 5.1. <laughs> and the roses were dying. <laughs> What you gonna do? Well, stop with the redwood right now, you know, and then they had to put products in there to get a little more alkaline. And they had to go through the permission processes. But we don't want to talk about Berkeley. They're crazy. <laughs> anyway, they fixed it and uh, they still don't spray anything, but they fixed it. Okay, if your pH is wrong, whatever right is for you. If the pH is wrong, adjust the pH. Don't sit there and whine about it. Don't tolerate it. Change it. There are ways to change it. Yeah, 6 to 6, 8. That's where they really would like to be in any kind of soil. 6 to 6, 8. We should all be so lucky. Okay, for rose people, this is the pH. Remember, seven is pure water. Healthy human saliva is six and a half. Milk is six and a half. The ocean is about eight. Bleach, really alkaline, is out there, 12 and a half. Lye, 13.5, it kills. Going in the other way, you can go to tea, acid rain, milk, coffee, beer, 4.5. If you need to acidify your soil, you can pour used beer on the soil. <laughs> yeah, lemon juice, battery acid, et cetera. pHs, yes. Uh, yes. Have you ever been to Yellowstone? Oh, well, look at some pictures of the geysers and the, the pools, the hot pools in the Yellowstone National Park. You'll see all those colors and et cetera. 
Yeah, the pH is all wonky, going up and down and sideways. Various algaes and other life forms <laughs> will survive in that water. Roses won't. Yeah, well. Okay, almost all fertilizers that you use, whether they're manufactured, which is what chemical means, manufactured or they're organic, gathered from once living materials, they'll try to make the soil a bit more acidic, which is nice. Because remember that water that was really alkaline? It's a good thing that the fertilizer is a little bit acidic and I'm trying to keep up with it. Go again. Okay. One of the reasons the pH needs to be balanced is because all those minerals that we talked about in the root zone at the last lecture, going into solution, being slurped up and passed up the plant, they can't go into solution if the pH is wrong. Your nutrients are the yellow, okay? And you'll see that right in this zone, from six and a half to seven is the best. You get the fat part, mostly, of every single one of them right there. You still got it here, you still got it here, and then it gets crazy over here, and it gets crazy over here. Diminishing, this one is nuts, diminish and then grow. It's because there are chemical reactions going on at different pH levels in the water and the soil, okay? It will lock up your chemicals at one point, release them at a different point. The stable pH, you find that sweet spot and you keep your soil as close to that as possible. That's the best. Come on in, Laura. Have a seat. Okay, no points for you. Okay, here's how you keep your pH correct. If your soil is acidic, like Berkeley, you can add lime, that's limestone, ground up, to increase the pH. But it takes time. It takes time because Mother Nature has to work on it. All the little, uh-oh, somebody didn't turn their phone off. Oh my God. Mother Nature has to work on it with the microbes and the various other things. Okay. You have to be a little careful, especially here in California, with magnesium in the soil. You know, California clay, that wonderful black, gray, yellow, stinking clay, has all of these great minerals in it. It's got a lot of magnesium most of the time. Most of the time. Some places don't. But if you've got high magnesium, be sure you do your soil test to know what kind of lime you might need if you're going to raise the pH. <coughs> now, most clays are not acidic. They're alkaline, so I don't expect to have you people out there putting limestone on. But if you're in sands or some of our mountain areas, that could be a little different. If you're on land that evolved underneath a seabed and has risen in the last 20,000 years, and there are a couple of places, I'm thinking of Dixon Landing, places like that. You might have acidic soil. It would be different. Yeah. Okay, here's us. If the soil is alkaline, what are you going to do to bring the pH down? Organic material. Compost. Oh, the old days. Peat moss. Don't use peat moss. Use coir. Uh, coconut shavings, you know. Peat moss is not renewable within our lifetime. Okay, it will lower the pH slightly, but you just keep doing it. And it is a slow process, a continual process. You can sprinkle ground sulfur. That works a little bit faster, but sulfur also will have consequences with some of the other soil chemicals, so read your labels. But you need to keep working if you're on clay because your water is alkaline also. So between that and the substances in your soil, you need to always try to use products that are slightly acidic. <coughs> a really nice balanced mulch with a lot of old coffee grounds from Pete's or Starbucks 
great stuff. No caffeine left, lots of munchies for the earthworms. Oh, and you know those little organisms? What goes in goes out, and what goes out is in solution? Nutrients. Yep. Okay, fertilizers always list NPK on the label. N, N is nitrogen. P is phosphorus, K is potassium. And that's just because they wanted to throw you by using Latin. Yeah, K is for callium. We don't speak Latin anymore unless we're in church. We call it potassium. But those are the three primary nutrients that our roses need. Another one. Okay. They will always put it on the bag. N. P. K. Going to find out who's naughty or nice, you bet. No Christmas present for you. Okay. So read your labels. You want, when you put uh, soil amendments on your garden soil, you want to be sure that you stay steady. There are different growth characteristics that respond to those three minerals. Okay? Towards the end of the program, you'll see what we're talking about when we talk about them individually. But a nice even dose where the numbers are not too high, they're not too low, and they're not too out of whack. If you've got something over here that says 68, 10, 0, <laughs> you're probably, you've got a mix for a golf course, not your garden. So don't do that. And again, when you buy this stuff, Remember that roses cannot read. They don't notice the picture of the rose on the package. <laughs> so buy cheap, buy in bulk, and buy often, and store it to be spread around, especially if it's got a lot of organic material in it. Shredded everything is good. Remember, the alkalinity is going to go down. Down. Yes. OK, John. Nitrogen, number one. California soils, as I mentioned, have everything in them except nitrogen. We're very low on nitrogen because our soils are very young. Clay. Clay is the richest soil imaginable, Carl, and we've got plenty of it. No, it does not have a lot of nitrogen. So. <laughs> Oh, it's got everything, though. Um, nitrogen fuels the growth of the plant. Nitrogen causes the plant to go up. It will make tall, strong canes, rich, dark green foliage. If it's lacking, your foliage is going to get light green, almost turn yellow. If you have too much, if you put that 68% stuff on there, you'll burn them. Nitrogen burns. Now, you're going to buy something that has nitrogen in it. It's going to be manufactured because nitrogen is, is a gas. So you're not going to buy a can of it. It doesn't come that way. Well, it does, but you're not going to buy it that way. <laughs> um, so there are various granular formulations that will have nitrogen in one of its many forms. We'll get to its forms. One of them you don't buy unless you really, really want Homeland Security to come to your house. Okay. Phosphorus, the middle number. Phosphorus is good for your roots, stimulates their growth, and it will help with big blooms. Uh, on the East Coast, it will cause the plants to become mature a little bit early and go into their winter dormancy. Here in California, it might cause your plants to stop blooming around New Year, at which time by then you're sick and tired of it anyway, and you're pruning. So it can get locked up. Phosphorus gets locked up if the soil is acid. Not going to happen in my yard, I'll tell you. It also moves very slowly in the soil, so you don't have to keep dumping it in there. Very thin application if you use it, not dumping huge gobs in all the time. Because it does its work when it's in the root zone. Root zone is down there a ways. 
not on the top. And if you put it on the top and scratch it in and put the mulch on top and then water it, an inch at a time, year by year, it gradually gets down there and by that time the plant has said, forget about it. <laughs> Potassium. All around good growth, vigor, vitality, nice color, especially color. A uh, very essential element in making the chlorophyll. Remember in the spring when the leaves are all bronze and red and purple, they have to get green by making new chloroplasts. Okay, they need potassium. It helps move those nutrients around. It's very good at hooking things together. But it can flush out really fast. So keep an eye on your potassium levels. That is a good sprinkler if you have need of it. Again, soil testing, soil testing. And watch the color in your plants. We'll get to a slide a little later that'll show you what it kind of looks like if, you, if you've bummed it up. Julie, can I ask you something? We have this lovely clay soil, which it's hard for the water to penetrate. If this potassium is going down so fast, it, it's sitting at the bottom there. No, it's gone on out. But do you think it goes out or it stays in there? It leaks right on out. Yeah, yeah. That's why you're adding organics to clay as much as you can stuff in there to make it fluffy. And it's a never-ending battle because all of the little earthworms and critters in the soil eat it up and excrete minerals that feed your rows and you've got a beautiful garden, but the compost and stuff goes away and you have to add some more. Okay. Okay. On the label, usually in the back, you will see again the three numbers, and that's a nice even set right there. And then they'll talk to you about what all is in that fertilizer. Sometimes it will be sectioned out saying macronutrients, micronutrients, itty bitty teeny minute, you know, minute particles. Okay. It will give you the amount of nitrogen. And some bags will also tell you the kind of nitrogen. Nitrogen comes in four forms. There's ammoniacal nitrogen, artificially formulated from ammonia compounds, okay. There's urea nitrogen, artificially compounded, again, same thing. Uh, there's water insoluble nitrogen, and that's usually used in the rosin pellets, you know, like um, Osmocote, stuff like that, Apex. What's the other form, Baldo? Uh, nitrate nitrogen. Nitrate nitrogen. Okay. So, and then uh, some of them get tricky, and we'll give you the chemical formula of the kind of element that's in there. You don't really need to worry too much about that as long as you're balancing and you've had your soil test so you know not too much of something that you've already got a lot of. You don't have to memorize it either. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a particular micronutrient that's better? No. Roses? No, there's no micronutrient that's better than any other one. They're all important. Okay, here's a memory aid for NPK. How to remember it? Think of up, down, and all around. Nitrogen grows it up, phosphorus grows it down, and potassium is good all around. You got it, Sue. That's right. <laughs> okay. So the second set of macronutrients, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. These are good in the soil. They can get poisonous if there's too much. So we usually will advise you, unless you're soil testing every single year and watching the nutrient level, don't buy something that's got specific micronutrients in it because you don't know whether you need it or not. Just get the ones with trace traces of micronutrients because the reason they got the word micro on there is they don't need a lot. Micro means little teeny bit for the whole garden, maybe only that much in solution. Yeah, 
So don't, don't get crazy and buy a bag of sulfur and a bag of copper and a bag of magnesium. No, don't do that. I've seen gardens where they, it's not pretty, don't do that. Sulfur needed for proteins and it also helps lower the pH, okay. Magnesium, very essential for chlorophyll, healthy. Be very careful, California soils have a lot of magnesium. There is a product that people will tell you, oh, put it on for basal breaks. Don't do that. And then calcium. Calcium holds the cell walls together. <coughs> Miners are often called trace elements. The bag will just say trace. Okay, that means the very, very small <coughs> amounts are needed. Uh, you could get a decrease in production of roses if you're counting how many blooms each plant is pumping out, which if you're running a rose factory, you would be counting how many blooms each. They do that, you know, in the cut rose industry. These poor slaves are sitting there in their hydroponic tank and they're counting how many blooms each plant. And if she's not producing, it's over. Put another one in there. Yeah, they're rough. Okay, um, they can interfere with NPK in various combinations. They'll link or unlink when they're not supposed to. So again, you can really mess up your soil by playing chemistry. It's much better to let a chemist play chemistry and you just do a soil test and watch your plants. Now, as good rose gardeners, you're probably out there every day, even when it rains, which <laughs> Never happens, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> but uh, you're watching your plants, and you can tell when one is starting to look a little shaky or something's going wrong, and it's not the usual suspects. You know, you'll know. Okay, John. One of the micros is iron, and I know that in the 50s and 60s, everybody was on a kick about, we gotta add iron to the soil. They're putting rusty nails down in the ground <laughs> and used staples and all of this stuff. Well, iron is essential, but you know what a, a leaf looks like when your plant doesn't get enough iron. Or do you? Could be not enough nitrogen, or might be oxygen deficiency. Nah, wrong venation. Okay, so you have to know what to look for. And you know, there are color pictures in your consulting rosarian manual that will show you what those lacking nutrients will make a leaf do. And we've got some reproductions here. Um, they're not the best because most of them are from tomato leaves because I couldn't find any leaves in my garden that did this. But, okay. Manganese for your chlorophyll, zinc to get stems and flowers. You don't really care about this stuff. Come on, John. Boron, okay. We do have a problem with boron in the soil. Uh, slightly west of Sacramento and up a bit. Davis, Davis area and uh, Concord. Concord. And Woodland, yeah, Woodland. Concord has boron also, yeah. yeah. So don't, you know, look at those fertilizer bags and if you know you've got it in the soil and you're buying fertilizer, it says it's got it, don't buy that bag, buy some other, you know. Why add to your problem? Okay, copper. We actually use copper in our soil, yep. Molybdenum makes amino acids. <coughs> Okay, your, four, your uh, basic fertilizers, they can be granular, you know, little grains, pellets, that kind of stuff. Um, powdered, so it's fluffy. The, and that's a little dangerous because the powder, if you're going to pour it into something, it might be powdery enough to fluff around in the air and you're gonna breathe it. Not good, don't breathe ucky stuff. It's um, dangerous for your health. Yeah. Okay, then there's the liquid form, usually concentrated. You have to shake it up and then add it to water somewhere. 
And then there's the solid form, which is the spikes or the little spheres or whatever. And the idea there is it's slowly going to dissolve in moist soil, if you have moist soil. <laughs> yeah. So you have to think all these different classes you've been taking. You know, you're getting a little bit of here, a little bit of there, and you're going to put it all together and say, oh my god, now I know what happened when, yeah, okay. Okay, here's your uh, organic fertilizers and inorganic fertilizers. Organics are the ones that come from something that was alive at one time. Even manures came out of something that was alive at one time. And all of the organic fertilizers will be very low in nutrient content. They're very, very balanced also. They're very slow release because they have to rot. And they have high levels of carbon. And they slowly will add humus to your soil. They're organic. Organic fertilizers are a good thing, but they take time. So usually you'll supplement with a little bit of a handful of this or a handful of that as you go along, depending on what you figured out that your soil needs. Inorganics also can be granular, liquid, powdered, solid, the whole bit. They're just manufactured, okay? They're made from something. Even if it's just natural rocks, natural sulfur, which are natural, and it's ground up, it's manufactured. Somebody's making a buck off of it, putting it in a bag. Okay, these are usually salts, chemical salts, not like shaker salts, okay? And they can interfere with the way the water is absorbed in the roots. Think back to your water class. You get told this over and over and over, that too many minerals in the water will cause the absorption of that water to go way down, okay? Don't let it build up in the soil, and you can remember probably when you were a kid driving down the valley towards the mountains and looking out at the farmland with that white crust of stuff on the soil that's what they're talking about those were salts that built up from various fertilizers that were used to i think it was cotton wasn't it where's the bergs cotton most of the cotton crops yeah okay but the nutrients in there in the inorganics are almost immediately available. It's like fast food, you know? Uh, slow cooking at home to make a pot roast with all the vegetables and stuff takes several hours with a lot of anticipation and then you enjoy the meal and then you sit around and talk and you digest. Or you go to McDonald's and get a burger and eat it and 15 minutes later you're off and doing something else. Okay, inorganic is fast food. And sometimes that's what you need, a little pinch here, a little pinch there, nothing wrong with it. Now, here is where you hear heresy. <laughs> Are you ready? Roses cannot eat organic nutrients. <laughs> no! <laughs> heresy. <laughs> All of those organics you're putting on there, have to be gobbled up by the microorganisms in the soil. And like I said, what goes in comes out. But when it comes out, it's minerals dissolved in water. It is now inorganic. So the words, don't get excited about them. You know, when all the marketing hype is going on about you have to be this or that, use the word sustainable. Sustainable is good because most of you are doing that anyway. You know how to garden. You know how to garden. Okay, go again. Carl, not now. <laughs> again, just in case. Now, Carl, it's your turn. All right, synthetics. Do they have an adverse effect on mycorrhizae? <coughs> I've never talked to the mycorrhiza at my house. I can only assume that anything you put down will have an effect. Now, whether it's adverse I had heard that it or was. otherwise, I don't know. But you could probably burn the mycorrhiza with too much of a good thing. 
So I'm assuming they would rather have humus and compost than a handful of um, ammonium sulfate. Yeah. You know, just just thinking. So what is the right amount per rose bush? No. <coughs> mm -mm. Mm -mm. Okay. Okay. Here's some of the organic stuff that you use: cottonseed meal, blood meal, bone meal, alfalfa meal, and your own homemade compost or store-bought compost or shredded bark from the forests. California is coated with forests. Uh, you can use chopped up marijuana leaves. That works fine. You can use coffee grounds. You can use tea bags. All kinds of stuff that will rot and feed the microorganisms so they can get on the trip with you and excrete the material into liquid form so that your roses can have a healthy diet. All these things, very good. Oh, microbreweries. California's got microbreweries. <coughs> the stuff that's left over. <coughs> you know, they have to pay people to come and truck that away to the dump. What if you walked into your favorite microbrewery, bought a couple of cases, and then you said, you know, if you've got any mast left over, I could use a pickup load. Mast, M-A-S-T. The, the mush at the bottom of the tank after the beer is made, it's got to go somewhere. Think what your garden would smell like <laughs> for about three days. <laughs> but yeah, that works too. Okay, here's a few more organics that you can use. Fish emulsions, mushroom composts, seaweed or kelp manures any kind. Watch out for birds. I'll tell you why. Sewer sludge, don't do that. Uh, Milorganite Mil advertises a lot. Uh, if you want to buy the stuff from the sewers in Milwaukee and put it on your garden, then that's Milorganite. I don't want to do that. Uh, going back to manures and birds. Problem with birds Excuse me for being vulgar, but mammals, like cows, horses, elephants, rhinoceroses, have two ways to get rid of what they ate. Comes out as a solid, comes out as a liquid, okay? With birds, it all comes out together. And that's why chicken manure, turkey manure, pheasant manure, bird stuff, might burn unless it's aged because the wet component is pretty acidic, okay? Just be careful. Fresh cow manure will do the same thing because cows are not too selective in what they eat. And you know, you've always heard, uh, if you're gonna use horse, then make sure it's from a stabled horse, not one that's his pasture, because you don't want a, a lot of uh, seeds from whatever he ate. Uh, it gets really exotic if you're in San Francisco and buy the bags of the Zudu because you've got giraffe and elephant and rhino mixed up there. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Okay, no sewer sludge, though. Come on. Other types of fertilizer. We talked about slow release, the pellets. Okay, um, it's water-insoluble nitrogen because the casing does not dissolve, okay? It's activated by warm soil, warm, moist soil, warm, moist soil with lots of bacterial activity going on, not cold, not dry, and not where you don't have a lot of healthy microorganisms. So if you're going to use the pelletized stuff, it should be in the hot country, and you really need to moisten your garden so that this stuff uh, dissolves right. Okay. Uh, the major advantage, this one says uh, it reduces the chance of fertilizer burn because it only leaks out a little bit at a time. The other major advantage is the gardener doesn't have to go out there and take care of their garden very often. They just put it in in March and think they're done until October. Maybe, maybe not. 
Have you ever dug up a plant and found all those little empty casings and thought you had snails? It's interesting. Okay. Be very uh, cautious about applying fertilizers and amendments. If you put it on too late in the fall, it's going to interfere with the cycle of the life processes in the plant slowing down and going into our California dormancy, which is not a real dormancy because they never really go asleep, you know. They, they talk to you in January. Yep. Okay, and if you overwater, uh, the nutrients will be released too fast. The soil can't absorb it. The microorganism, microorganism can't keep up with it. And you'll just waste time and money, which that's the way it goes. In the drought, we've been told to water once a week for an hour. Is that overwatering? Depends on your garden, honey. How many plants do you have? How many inches of water do you put down, et cetera, et cetera? And what kind of soil you have, and the percolation rate, and etc. You have to adapt to what you're allowed to do. And if you recapture water for, with uh, rain or fog or anything, you'd be amazed how much water you can capture just from a good fog bank. You'll get a couple of gallons every day. That can be used. Yes. Okay. Here we are with the forms of nitrogen. Nitrate, nitrogen would be the best. It works really fast. It goes bang, Spider-Man. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about the soil organisms, but it can be hot, hot, hot. It can burn. So if you're going to use nitrate nitrogen for a quick pick-me-up, very, very little. The um, ammoniacal, it is available as the soil organisms work on it. Not right away, but fairly fast. And you'll get this like with ammonium sulfate, the bags of that stuff. You'll get that. Uh, urea nitrogen, this is really slow. This has to be broken down over time. Usually you won't find it, but some bags will have a little bit of this and a little bit of that in it mixed. Kind of stretching out the duration of the dissolving of the nitrogen into the soil. And then there's <coughs> nitrite, which is rarely used and too expensive. And that's the one that you uh, don't want to buy. Mm -hmm. oh. Boom. Yeah. Berkeley activists buy a lot of it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Nutrient imbalances. This is, this is the stuff you need to learn about. Nitrogen. Notice the leaf. If you don't have enough of it, the older foliage is going to slowly, I'm crossing over, by the way, John, hold, hold on, don't yell at me. Hand out, one for each, all the way around. If you run out, too bad. Okay, uh, light green or even yellowing. If it's a nitrogen problem, yes, this is a tomato leaf. Don't give me grief about it. Remember that nitrogen goes through the soil pretty fast. And lack of oxygen in the soil after heavy rains can make the leaf look like this, but it'll never happen in California, so don't worry about it. Um, tall canes, we've gone over that. Water soluble, da -da, we got okay. The only important thing here that we haven't discussed is if you don't have enough nitrogen, the leaves are going to start to yellow, and you're going to see veins, but not really prominent. And the picture in your CR manual is better than this. Sometimes you're going to think, oh, I've got an iron deficiency, because after all, that's what everybody was all excited about. Well, nitrogen almost looks the same, almost. But the leaves are very clear. But here, it's all still green. It's not yellowing up. Chlorosis. Soil test, unless you're absolutely sure that you have an iron deficiency. If you think you've got an iron deficiency, buy a fertilizer that has chelated 
iron in it. Chelation is a chemical process that will make the iron dissolve better and not hook up with other elements in the soil. Okay, <coughs> phosphorus. This one is crazy. You'll see it in your garden and not know what it is. It's not cute. The banding on the leaves is a dark reddish purple. It's really strange. If your leaf starts turning kind of purple, this is a major suspect. Get a soil test because phosphorus, if the pH goes below, if you've acidified too much and it goes below six, it will lock up that phosphorus so your, your plants can't pull it out of the soil, okay? Just remember the purple banding. Potassium. This one is a little harder. It kind of looks like almost everything else that might go wrong, except that the edges of the leaf will start uh, getting very brittle. They might crack, and then they'll start turning brown. Usually the older foliage, and again, it's because potassium can leach out. And so you'll be losing it through the, waters, the water uh, running away. Okay. Calcium. This is a bad picture of tomato leaves that are lacking calcium. The leaves are starting to curl up. Brown edges and brown spotting. You don't often see this in roses. Have you guys seen it in your yard steps? No. Neither have I. I think we're pretty, pretty good on calcium. Oh, and a little gratuitous note from the healthcare professionals. <coughs> Make sure that you get your tetanus shot every 10 years. And then I need to tell you if you're an older person, older than me, they might try to tell you, oh, you don't need one. Yes, you do. They just think you're going to die before the next 10 years. <laughs> Get your damn shot. <laughs> Go. Magnesium. Aha. Yeah. Magnesium. The center part of the leaf stays green, and the outer edges start losing color. It's still stiff. It's still crisp. Magnesium is going. You probably won't see that in California. We've got enough magnesium and not enough rain, so it's going to stay with us. Reason we're speeding up is the bar is open. <laughs> Sulfur. <laughs> the veins in the leaf are not standing out like green veins are supposed to. They're blending in with the leaf tissue. The leaf is slowly fading and the veins are fading too. It might be sulfur problems. Again, soil test. Manures, composts. And then the really neat thing about composts and manures and old pine needles, the Christmas tree, shredded up, leaves, the whole bit, is they rot slowly and they're processed by the microorganisms and they're almost neutral, but they drive slowly the pH back towards the range you want. Takes years, but you've got the time. <laughs> You're not up and moving. <laughs> okay, iron again. Uh, shows up in the new leaves at the top of the bush, the chlorosis. Manganese. You get brown and black blotching. That is not black spot, and it is not downy mildew. It's actual problems inside of the leaf in the tissue. It's dying inside because it wasn't getting enough manganese. <coughs> uh, if your pH gets up into the range with the, that the rose really likes, it locks up the manganese. So you have to kind of stay just below 6.8. At 6.5, that's good. Crazy, I know. Manures and alfalfa meal, stuff like that, will help. Boron, we've talked about the problems you guys have. Um, again, your organic products in the soil will help ameliorate that, if at all possible. Zinc gives 
yellow blotches not often seen these are micronutrients don't often see a deficiency usually we have enough copper uh, copper will give you brown spots and the leaves will start to curl Malid yeah molybdenum molybdenum <laughs> molybdenum <laughs> okay and you'll get the rolled margins I think these probably were reversed but uh, with molybdenum deficiency you'll also get the edges rolling up Did you get a handout? Yes. Well, well, it tells you about that top and bottom. Okay. Uh, this one I don't think you have on your handout. No. Okay. It's a really nice key. You can get it off of Wikipedia. Just look for nutrient imbalances in plants and you'll hit this chart in old leaves and you just follow it. Say the old leaves. She's saying the old leaves. Something's happening to the old leaves. Okay. If the lower leaves dry up, go down here. If there's light green lower leaves or yellow stalks or this or that, you go on down and you find what it is. It's a key. It's a key to what might be wrong. And just because your leaf is showing a symptom, you better be really sure before you treat. Because some of these symptoms can look just like the other one, except for one little thing and you get really excited and you miss the little thing because you're sure you found it. So, again, rather than buy trace elements to scatter on your soil, it would be much better if you used organic materials to scatter on your soil and let the critters bring it in. And you know, um, the latest word is the no-till way of gardening. Yeah. Don't dig, don't scratch, don't break the soil, just let the microorganisms rotate the stuff through. Is that what it's called? I thought it was just pure damn lazy. <laughs> I don't know. Potato, potato. <laughs> <laughs> low, low, low maintenance from the other side of the room, yes. Okay, uh, many problems are not because they're not there. It's because they've been locked up by your pH. So again, it's back to soil test and keep that pH where it's supposed to be. If you stay right around 6.5 to 6.8, most of these problems you'll never see because it'll be just right they're still going to be able to get to the nutrient and not have too much or too little or have a fight going on between the nutrients as to who's going to couple up with who and lock up so the plant can't have any. Okay? Again. Okay, test your soil. Um, the soil has to be warm for inorganics because the microorganisms have to break it down. It has to go into solution and then they have to fiddle around with it and mellow it out and then it's ready to go. Cold soil does not work really good with artificial fertilizers. Uh, constantly using an artificial or a manufactured fertilizer destroys the structure of the soil. Remember your soil classes. We talked about tilth and texture. If you destroy that, then no matter if you've got the finest clay in the world with the best manures on it, it's not going to work. Just as I said at the beginning, if you took all of the things that make soil and put them in a bucket and stir it up and add water, you're not going to make soil. You're just going to have a bucket of muddy stuff. It's a structure, a geological masterpiece. It's been working for years, and you try really hard not to destroy the balance. Yes, Charlie? When you say the soil has to be warm, I don't know how to take the temperature of the soil. Uh -huh. you know, like, <laughs> to take your, your right hand, bend over. 
I, he's going to make me do this on film. Thank you, John. Right hand, bend over, put it flat on the bare soil. What does the soil feel like? Is it colder than the skin of your hand? Or is it warmer than the skin of your hand? If it's warmer, the sun must be out. But it's just like an easy way to figure out if you've got enough water in the soil. Stick your finger in it down to the second joint. Is it still moist? You know what moist soil feels like. I mean, hey, we're gardeners, man. We can do this. Still like the bare bat, uh, method. Baldo wants us to film that with me in a mini skirt. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> feeding, <laughs> feeding, how, how often do you feed? You don't want to overfeed, you don't want to underfeed. We've preached um, the holiday method for casual gardeners, exhibitors, of course, caution is thrown to the winds and you guys are going to do what you're going to do anyway, but four to six times during the year, that's all they really need, and then just this much. Forget about a full coffee can of this is good. No, it's not. Little bit, little bit. And trickle it, you know? Cover it up with a mulch so it doesn't blow away. <coughs> water deep before you fertilize, water again afterwards. Now we're in a drought, so you're going to have to worry about how you're going to water deep. But you can do that with a coffee can or a five gallon bucket. Just blurp, 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 blurp over an hour, let the bucket soak down and then put the fertilizer and put the mulch on top. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. <coughs> Feed me. <laughs> okay. You, yes. Uh, uh, can you talk about fol foliar feeding? Foliar feeding. Remember when we <coughs> had the picture of the leaf and I said it has a cuticle on it that keeps you know, things from going through. One of the good things about that cuticle, sideways here, uh, fungus spores that will float along and land, and then the little dentate thing, or their tooth, goes to pierce down through the skin of the rose to get to the juicy stuff. Can't get through the cuticle. That's why we tell you, if you buy the rose, you look for the ones that have really thick leaves or a lot of wax on the leaf limp thin leaves will get diseases, tough leaves that are almost like plastic usually won't. Well that cuticle is, is semi impervious to water. Yes, water can get through it, but only at selected times and you realize we talked about the stomata, most of those are on the underside and around the edges. Very few of them are on the top because that cuticle will block them. So if you're foliar feeding, how is that stuff supposed to get inside the leaf? <laughs> that would work. Yeah. You could spray the ground also. Jennifer says from the bottom with a water wand. Okay. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry I didn't mention worm casings and castings and worm juice and stuff. That's all part of organics. It's very good. If you've got a worm farm running, definitely the, the sludgy, leaky stuff that comes out can be part of the supplement of your watering. It is not salty in the chemical uh, term, and it's almost instantly utilized by microorganisms. It's a delight in your soil. So the little the bags you see at the store is just like, uh, like throwing it in the garden to the way everybody's going to have a good time? One would hope. Okay. <laughs> One would hope. But you know, it's just like building a compost pile. If you put a heap of organic stuff on the soil and a week later you pick it up and move it, you got all those red worms. You didn't buy those red worms. If you build it, they'll come. Okay. Where do you get calcium? Why? Because 
all the places I've seen sell Dolomite. Okay, Richard wanted to know where can you buy calcitic lime? He's got acidic soil. Oh yeah, you would. He lives up in the redwood forest. So he needs to actually put lime on to raise the pH. Anybody know where calcitic lime would be available? Sebastopol Harmony Farm Supply. You can Google them. Okay. All right, you got your point. Why are you still sitting here?